Good evening. We're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Randy Banks. I'm one of the assistant superintendents in the district, and I'd like to welcome you to our community meeting regarding our high school facilities. We appreciate you coming out on such a beautiful evening and participating um, in this event. And before I turn it over to one of our architects, I thought that I'd just give you a brief introduction um, and kind of highlight where we're at in this process. So several years ago, the district began to tackle three issues our aging facilities, um, the need to balance enrollment in our high schools, and the challenge to find capacity for all of the students that we needed to serve within our community. And we established a community task force made up of residents uh, within our community to help us tackle this issue. And for those of you who've been around, and I know we probably have some new people um, in the audience, but for the last several years, we've been working to accomplish that. Um, the community su supported a bond issue that allowed us to renovate the middle schools. We moved our sixth grade students to those middle schools, um, and we balanced the high schools by changing a feeder pattern. So our enrollment projections are that Kilbourne High School and Thomas Worthington should be very similar in size in the future and get closer together each year. We're, we're really excited about that. But we've remained committed to those um, issues and we want to continue to tackle those and so during phase two we established a new committee made up of some of you um, and we, we presented those three problems to that committee and we asked them to help us what should phase two look like here was the recommendation from the first task force but we want you to look at it with a fresh set of eyes and what they've determined are that our next priority should be our high schools and so we have begun the planning process on how we would tackle that issue. And um, using our architects, and we, we selected the same architects that helped us on the middle school projects, the same construction firm that helped us on the middle projects, we have begun to engage groups throughout our district on this process. So there's been meetings with students at the high school. There's been meetings with staff members at the high school. There's been meeting with administrators um, from each school. And tonight is our first meeting to involve the community um, as we begin to plan the next phase for our high school. So we're really excited that you're here. Um, our goal tonight is that you will leave excited. So the excitement levels go up and the anxiety levels go down. Some of you live close to the schools and you probably have some concerns. And I think that you'll find that our team um, cooperated very well with neighbors on our past construction projects. Um, we've employed the same team, so we will be good neighbors and good partners. And we're really interested in your feedback tonight and probably have a unique way to, to gather that, that input. So it's great to see some of the members of our Board of Education here tonight, representatives from the city of Worthington, some former task force members, and certainly neighbors in our community. So thank you so much for coming out tonight. And at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Mike Dingledine from Community Design Alliance to kind of lead us through some exercises to gather your feedback, inform you on where our plans are at at this early stage. Thank you. Thanks, Randy. I got this, so. And thank all of you. I know what schedules are like. I know when I look at my calendar on my phone, and I think of something that's gonna be fun to do, then I see the other three things I'm supposed to be doing. It's very hard, and this is a great turnout. So obviously there's some um, motivation and some commitment in the community, and I, I appreciate that. So we're gonna talk a little bit about where we are, and, and to say where we are, we're at the, near the end of programming, and programming is the numbers game. It's about the how much, how, how many classrooms, how many science labs, how big is the auditorium, how, uh, big is the cafeteria? How do we relate things together? We're going to show you what look like floor plans, and uh, they've got colors in all the rooms, and I, I liken it to uh, seeing colored jello in a, in a mold because we're interested in how much jello there is there. And once we know that, then we'll dive into the next level and start m moving things around and massaging things based on feedback that we've gotten. And as Rainey mentioned, we've had uh, focus groups with students at both high schools, focus groups with teachers, administrators. Uh, district folks, so we've gotten a lot of input to get to this point, and what we want from you tonight is to start talking especially about the 
mostly wholesale replacement of Thomas and what that looks like. Because I can tell you, when I was a high school swimmer in the 70s, I remember driving um, on, on the street in front of Thomas and saying, what a great uh, op, uh, high school, what a great view, what a great curb appeal, uh, and then what a brand new pool that was there the, when I was a swimmer in, in the 70s. So some of our design goals are, are fairly obvious. Um, that when we don't want to prioritize them, we want to get them all taken care of. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about personalized student experience because that's the thing that's really changing in education today. Um, there's a lot that, that never changes in education and a lot that changes for a little while, but that's changing, I think, long term. Uh, we want to be sustainable. We want these buildings to operate with less utilities and have better orientations to sunlight and daylight and have natural ventilation and all the things that make buildings better today. And that's something that's changed since uh, just in the last 10 to 15 years. The sustainability factors that we can put into new buildings is fantastic. Uh, both sites, uh, we obviously want to retain the asset value of what we've invested in. Uh, Thomas Worthington High School is way more than just a school building in the middle of the site. There's an investment in a huge array of other uh, assets that we're going to look at in the site plan. Same goes for Worthington Kilbourne. Uh, we're going to talk about site traffic safety and building life safety, both sites. We want to make it better always. And um, this one's a little bit um, gray. We want to be mindful of equity between the high schools. And what we've learned as we've moved together with both high schools at the same time, with both administrative teams from both high schools at the same time, is there's things at each high school uh, that we want to aspire to at the other high school. We love the two-story, huge daylight student commons at Worthington Kilbourne. We want to bring something to Thomas that resembles that. We want to bring them together. And so the strengths of one school get, you know, get aspired to at the other school and vice versa. So we want to, we want to think about the equity. And certainly they're going to be designed to the same uh, number of students. It's interesting, as of today, uh, the new Thomas is uh, around 300,900 square feet, and the Worthington Kilbourne renovation with a little addition is at 300,600 square feet. So we are within a handful of square feet at both schools being the same. And then finally, our biggest challenge is these schools don't close for two years while we renovate them. We have to maintain an excellent education operation in all these, both these sites as we build new high schools and renovate high schools around those operations. And we've engaged Rosilli Construction to help us with that challenge because it is, it is a big deal and we're thoughtful about it. This is a word, Graham, about learning styles, because everyone says learning styles are changing. Uh, traditional face-to-face -face learning isn't going away. It's still one of the biggest on there. Blended learning is probably the one it takes over, because what it's saying is there isn't one way that kids learn anymore. Uh, we had you know, a, a lot of forced uh, discussion about online learning because of the pandemic. It certainly is part of our uh, smorgasbord of learning styles. And what's, what I think everybody thinks today is there's no one way that students learn. There's lots of different ways, and we have to personalize that. So that's where this quote comes from, and it was Randy that helped me come up with this. The student experience is becoming more diverse, more personalized, and self-directed, especially at the high school level. Students are figuring out how they want to learn and how they want to engage with their high school. Uh, so we thought about those things when we did the middle schools. We created more common spaces for students. We created different kinds of opportunities for students to gather. We still created 900, 800 square foot classrooms where there's a teacher and a group of students learning together. But there are a lot of other places where students get connected socially, emotionally, and for learning from each other. So everything is a little different because we're thinking about that student experience. Uh, the way students break out into small groupings of furniture, the way students can reconfigure furniture to work together in different ways. Uh, and so we uh, aspire to that at the middle schools and we are aspiring at that um, at the new high schools as well. This is the core of Perry Phoenix. Again, it was a very um, complicated mishmash of concrete block offices and rooms. We gutted the whole interior of the building. We found the skylights above the space uh, and we created this kind of uh, breakout space for students to learn. And even at um, McCord, we took the hallways out around the cafeteria. We said it's not a space with a stage and a cafeteria and hallways all around it. It's one big open space. We created the daylight. We created some furniture uh, options for kids. Uh, and it's, it's been a very, very popular new space for those buildings. So when I learned and how happy I was that this was going to be a project I got to do to Thomas Worthington High School from knowing it from the 70s, I also got very intimidated looking at this site 
uh, it looks like a domino effect. When I touch one thing, what happens to all the other things around it? And so we created a little exercise early on late last year uh, where we said, what are all the assets on this site? And I'll just talk about them briefly. Four is the competition gym, 4B is the auxiliary gym, five is this auditorium, you know, tennis courts, McConnell, uh, an elementary school that's a neighbor, stadiums, all the swimming pool complexes, the field house, the parking lots, uh, athletic fields. What is it that we have to make sure we plant, we don't pivot on? What do we have to save no matter what? Anybody want to guess what by far the number one priority was? Number seven, the trees, the front yard. You know how easy it would be to build a new high school right here and then tear that one down? It would be so easy, but it would be the worst possible scenario in terms of a plant or pivot. So we are keeping uh, every bit of the trees in the front yard, in the, the boundary trees, and we are staying to the existing footprint of that high school. It makes it harder to build and harder to transition, but it's a better way to uh, maintain those resources and keep the greatest assets that are part of this site. So that's a quick look at where we are. And again, this is a changing, evolving thing. We know we're looking at replacing the swimming pool, the natatorium, but we don't know if moving it to a new site to keep this one operating while we do that is the right answer. We're playing around with that, and we want to see what the domino effect is of when we start to do things. So we're, we decided to keep the gym and the auxiliary gym. It'll have all new mechanical systems, all new finishes, all new lighting. We're even going to have natural light in the competition gym that isn't there today. Uh, but all of the rest of that peach orange colored space, that's all new. So we're replacing the auditorium, we're replacing the front entry, but we aren't affecting uh, the front yard at all. So uh, we're pretty excited about that and we're also challenged by it because of the things we have to do. We need to reorient the baseball field because of the short left field and we believe bringing the uh, varsity softball field up to join with that field and put uh, common space between it is a good idea as well. So that's kind of where we are. Again, this is a moving target. Uh, but it's an evolving thing, but we're, we're feeling very comfortable that we're doing the right thing for the investment that's been made in this site. We have a new field house coming, and it's actually going to be under construction this fall. It's right in the same location as the current field house, uh, but it has a lot more uh, appropriate facilities and match to the kind of needs that are out there by the football stadium. You can see there, it sits right where the Dow Nelson uh, field house is currently. And then we're looking at this. And again, I remember this from the 70s. It's iconic. It's an architectural element. Uh, even the, um, the logo for Worthington for a while was, uh, was an abstracted piece from this, uh, this entrance. What's happened, though, at Thomas is over time, this was the first iteration of Thomas High School, um, it was very well balanced. The, the, the symmetry was good. Uh, the height and width of the elements that you see, the setback from the road felt pretty good. Uh, but it grew 20 more times from this. And so as you look at where the ex original Thomas was, uh, look what's happened to it over the uh, last 70 years. It's become a different building, and the building's entrance no longer scales to the, 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 the sprawling building that we have today. It's not that that was done wrong. It's just that nobody could have predicted how much more Thomas was to be built over the next 70 years. So here's the new Thomas, perhaps. And again, I, I, would, I would caution you to think of this as colored jello. The green jello is mostly there. That's the auxiliary gym and the competition gym and the supporting space. The other parts of the building are new. We contemplated keeping the auditorium and finally ultimately came to the conclusion it wasn't, it wasn't going to work. There were too many challenges to leave this standing and build new around it. So we have an entirely new fine arts wing to the east. We have the existing but all renovated like new athletic wing to the west. We have the common spaces, administration, cafeteria, um, media center upstairs, and then we have a three and two story combination uh, uh, academic wing across the front. We'll have a new Thomas facade that is relatively flat. Uh, there's some undulation in it, but it will be scaled for the distance from this door to the street is gonna feel right and it's gonna balance east to west as well in terms of scale. And one of the things we're gonna talk about tonight a lot is scale. Uh, this is the, the new footprint sitting over the old footprint. So a couple good things here. We get a lot of new site space when we're done, and we also get a lot of swing space while we're building new because we will be able to stay in a lot of the old building at that time. So there's still a lot of challenges, but we have a plan 
uh, to use this until we are done and have the new school built and then take this away and have uh, some additional site space to do more development. And then there's a second floor and a third floor uh, that sits on top of the center. What's great about this new scheme is what used to be three quarters of a mile across to Thomas east to west is now going to be about 500 feet. So much shorter distances. There is a clear uh, athletic to fine arts entrance. There's a clear front door to student commons, indoor and outdoor student common space uh, that makes the sense of this building. And there's a, a rotunda oculus in the middle that becomes the, you know, the intersection of Main Street and High Street for this new school. Um, again, look at the assets behind us, but even the assets in this space, this green space behind the, the existing three-story wing, we want to make that a new outdoor student commons. It will be protected and contained inside walls and fences, but it will be part of the new school where students will experience you know, an indoor-outdoor kind of ability to, uh, to work and learn and communicate and collaborate. Worthington Kilbourne. Uh, we, we aren't replacing existing building. We aren't tearing it down. This building was built in 92, or about the same time as uh, the athletic addition was to Thomas, and I'm sure those were coordinated uh, because they're very similar. Uh, this building has the most incredible natural feature, which is the ravine that goes through the site. It's well integrated with the building, but it also is a challenge because it kind of separates the north side of the site and our access to the public streets from all the athletics in the back. So we're working hard to figure out how we'll challenge ourselves uh, to get that fixed. Um, we don't see the exterior outside of the building changing, although we're going to upgrade windows, upgrade roofing, upgrade doors, uh, make all those things come up to uh, a like new condition um, for a 30-year-old building, 35-year-old building. So we have more of a list of renovations for Kilbourne. Science labs, restrooms, auxiliary gym, athletic support facilities, field turf, outdoor learning, remember, remember that one, HVAC upgrades, site circulation improvements, breakout spaces. Students said, let's get rid of the locker bays, let's create student collaboration spaces where those are. That was their idea. Um, locker bay repurposed, that, that was the next one. And then fine arts additional space. The fine arts space at Kilbourne is one of the few things in that building that really isn't up to what I would say is a current standard in terms of square footage. And so we're going to address that. This is the kind of features that we want to bring to Thomas because this is one of the real strengths of this school. The daylight in the center core of the building coming from the roof, uh, the daylight coming from the two-story uh, curtain wall, looking out over a natural uh, location over that ravine, very cool stuff. And it's right in the, where in the building where all the activity hub works around the center core. Uh, it is right in here. Um, and so, with that ravine there and the idea that the, um, the two-story student commons is already in place, uh, we had teachers and students say, why don't we build a porch outside of the student commons that overlooks the ravine? Um, it is just an idea at this point, but we want to take that idea all the way through to engineering to see if it makes sense. Uh, again, same kind of concept, front door to athletics to fine arts, the student experience going from the media center to the cafeteria, student commons to the outdoor space. It's exactly the same concept that's supporting what we're doing um, at Thomas. We're going to renovate science labs. We're going to renovate computer labs. We're going to put more classrooms on outside walls so they have natural light. There is a huge bank of classrooms in the center of this school, very efficient, uh, but not very nice when you stay in the classroom all day that has no daylight. So we're addressing that. There's that outdoor ravine outside of the cafeteria. We want to create some kind of outdoor porch that, over, that goes over the ravine but allows students to have outdoor collaboration space. And again, this is not being driven by architects, it's being driven by students and teachers. And again, I can't promise that we can make it work, but we certainly are going to give it a try. And then we'll have doors that go out of this space onto that porch and overlooks the natural ravine. So here's where we are tonight. We are pretty much done closing in on the end of programming requirements. We just started today talking about site design and orientation and those kind of things. What we want to hear from the community and from you folks in this room is what is the exterior appearance. We don't think we're going to change the exterior appearance of, of Kilbourne, but we definitely will have a brand new exterior appearance to Thomas Worthington. And that's what tonight's exercise is. If you haven't watched Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, 
when you ask the audience, they have these response cards, and we're going to start handing them out uh, to you guys here right now. And we'll tell you how to use them before you have to use them. Um, these are not architectural textbook styles. These are school imagery. These are school styles that go from the most historic, grounded by the most early architecture in the United States for schools, to something that is, whoops, that is the most contemporary. And there's five styles we're going to go through. It's a continuum. We don't want you to say there's only one style I want. You may want a little traditional, oh, sorry, a little traditional Ivy League campus and a little contemporary details. There is no absolute answer here. We're going to explain how we want you to differentiate as you think about what we show. I'm going to spend the next 20, 30 minutes talking about these five styles. And then when we're done with that, you're going to use your response cards to help us understand your answers. We're going to ask you three questions about each style. The first one is your gut feeling. We don't care what anybody next to you thinks. We don't care if you're, what your husband thinks if you're here with your wife. We th want to know what you think. Do you have a positive reaction to a certain style? Say yes, say no, in the middle is fine. We want to differentiate. Then we want you to put your community hat on and say, um, does this style fit the community, and particularly the Worthington community? And then the most important question, and the one that we want you to take the most care with, is this a style appropriate for the site? We all know the site. We all know the beautiful front yard and the trees. We got to know what needs to fit there. All right, here we go. You get three hours of uh, architectural school credit if you, uh, if you make it through this. So one room schoolhouses, why did they look like that? Why did they have certain architectural features? Today we think of, of articulation of buildings as aesthetic. We think we can do what we want. We can use brick. We can use stone. We can have steep roofs. We can have flat roofs. We can have tall windows. We can have wide windows. Why? Because we have the technology to do whatever we want. You need more? Here. That's great. We're over 100. <laughs> so raise your hand if you still need a card. Ooh, looks like we got it. Oh, okay. So let's look at it. Again, this building had, had its features based on what needed to happen to make it work. Uh, why, were, whoops, why were windows tall and narrow? Well, narrow is easy. It was hard to span openings in brick walls. You didn't have steel lintels. You had to use stone or arches and brick. And so the windows were narrow on purpose. Why were they tall? Anyone want to guess? Heat, light, heat, and cooling. You pulled the top half of the double hung sash down if you wanted the hot air to go out. You pulled the bottom sash of the double hung window up if you wanted cool air to come in. So high windows were a function of how buildings cooled themselves, how they ventilated. Uh, the corbels in the top of the wall made the wall strong enough to resist the loads coming off the roof. The roof was steep, so the loads were more straight up and down instead of pushing the walls out. So a steep roof was much easier to, to make work on top of a brick wall. Uh, so the articulation that you would say here, the decoration you would say here, almost all has a purpose. And if you look at some more, this is a one-room schoolhouse. The bell itself had a purpose. Um, again, the corbeling strengthened the roof, the tall windows, the, the, the uh, shutters actually were shutters. Um, all those things that you see had some function with how buildings had to operate. And if, and we just think of that as attractive and historic because that's how buildings were built in those days. So if you translate that into something modern, what would you do? You, you don't need to have narrow windows. You don't need to have tall windows. You don't need to have ventilators on the roof. You don't need to have um, ventilation in the gables. But if you do all those things, because you can, uh, you get a building that feels like a traditional, very historic schoolhouse. This is bigger than a one-room schoolhouse. It's actually an eight-room schoolhouse. Uh, but it is, does look historic. And it's because now we are using those elements of, of requirement from historic buildings, and we're using them to make elements of, uh, uh, of look and feel. So this is about what we're talking about tonight, is look and feel. So you can start to grow that up, and it starts to sort of lose itself. This doesn't look like that historic of a building. Uh, but it does have a lot of those elements in it that you would see in a, in a red brick schoolhouse. The steep roofs, the red brick, the water tables, the tall versus wide windows, all those things are here. 
and you can actually take it up to a very large scale. And that's where I think it starts to push into our next style, which I'll talk about here in a second. Uh, but the ventilators on the roof here were at the ends of the gables. The ventilators on the gables, the tall windows, the double hung windows, all those things come from an historic element, but they make the building look rather historic, and it would be hard to date this building other than this sense of scale and the size of it. You know that it's, you know, last 50 years and not 100 years ago. So we'll ask these questions when we get to the end. How appealing is it to you personally? How does it fit the community? And is it appropriate for the site? The next one moves up in scale. And so that's what I think our last picture and the last one maybe belongs on this side. And that is as buildings got needed to get larger because we were using schoolhouses for more people. And why were we doing that? Because of universities and higher learning. So that's where the traditional Ivy League campus comes in. These are buildings that were intended to have larger uses, more people in them. We started to occupy second floors. We started to learn for ways to use the roof space with those gables. Uh, all those things started to come into play. Um, this is actually at Miami University. It's a copy of the Wren Building from Williamsburg. And again, all the Williamsburg Wren Building features are there, the chimneys, the ventilators, the, the high windows, the porches. The problem is this building got a little too big for the Wren Building, uh, and it doesn't look that good because the windows feel too small in scale uh, for a building that in Williamsburg is half this size. So you have to be really careful when you use historic alliteration or historic elements because uh, you have to use it appropriately or it doesn't feel right. Here, aluminum windows. They can be very thin because aluminum is very strong. But in this school, they made them wide as they would be if they were wood. Why do they do that? Because it makes this building look more historically correct for whatever era they were bu buying. So the windows are accurate if they were built out of wood, but they were built out of aluminum. And so those details start to bring you forward. The stone trim, the little, uh, the little dome, uh, the, the mansard roof, these are all elements that are starting to bring us into larger scale buildings, but still lots of traditional details and traditional scale. This one's one of my favorites. Uh, this was actually um, the gable entrance and columns from the 1940 school in Cincinnati Public that when they replaced it, they wanted to keep the original entrance and build a new building around it that fit the scale and the history and the, and the chronological sort of location of where this building is. It's in Bond Hill in Cincinnati. Um, and so again, the rest of the building behind that um, limestone is new, but even the limestone doorway and surround is from the original Bond Hill Elementary. Two stories, but very traditionally and accurate in terms of how it's constructed, how windows are formed, how roof uh, shapes are formed. Newer, clearly looks newer, but very accurate in terms of some of the historical elements. St tall gables, some embedded um, classical details. Uh, you can tell the water table is block instead of limestone. That starts to give it away. Miami University in Oxford, I grew up in Oxford, uh, all these buildings are exactly this, traditional Ivy League campus. They picked a Georgian style, and they said the entire campus is going to be regulated by this style, whether it's a very new building like Pearson Hall, uh, the original Upham Arch, which is in the 40s, uh, to buildings like Irwin that, were built, Irwin that was built in the 20s and then was renovated in the, in the 2000s. Uh, but very much traditional Ivy League campus look. And guess what? We're kind of right there with our original high school um, at K Kilbourne Middle. Very much that kind of building. Uh, what I like about this building is it doesn't, it's not restrained by some of the limitations of historic architecture. By ganging two windows together, they got much bigger windows in the classrooms. And that is a very nice feature of Kilbourne Middle is the huge bright windows that bring in light to that building. And this building, you could say, was kind of there when it was built because I think it was trying to copy Kilbourne uh, to some degree, but the wide windows that were uh, you know, glass block and then operable windows below, that started to move out of that phase because it started to become less historic and tried to be more modern. So this is more authentic. Uh, this is more, I would say, modern, contemporary. Um, and so um, what you like, we're gonna talk about. All right, the middle, the middle ground here, public monument. Uh, very, very common in the United States to take Indiana limestone uh, and create uh, neoclassical buildings out of it. Uh, what's great about that is classical architecture, again, is very tried and true. 
A lot of about what happens with classical architecture was based on how they were able to build buildings uh, in those days, Roman and Greek days. Uh, very important buildings in every community and every capital are that. There's the Supreme Court building and the Ohio Capitol. Um, and this is the one that I think is one of the best examples in the country. When Thomas Jefferson spent several years in Europe and then came back to the United States, he brought with him that neoclassical architecture. Mixed it with a little bit of that um, uh, Ivy League campus, used red brick, uh, didn't use um, Indiana limestone, but created a style that's become very, very much uh, appro approved of by the public in terms of um, higher education architecture. This is obviously the UV campus uh, rotunda. So schools around here, again, they, they think of that building, they think of that style, they think the classical details make the building a little bit more important, a little bit more prominent, um, but behind that prominent sort of entry, like we saw at Bond Hill Elementary, is pretty much a, an Ivy League campus type of building. Again, nicely done, good details, uh, correctly proportioned details, good windows, all that sort of works together. And so, public monument doesn't mean the whole building is a, um, is a um, Greek neoclassical Indiana limestone building. It can mean that it's a mix of those kinds of things. And again, obviously, any architecture, any amount of glass, any amount of detail can be structurally handled now. So we get ourselves either re really close to uh, neoclassical detailing and proportions and, and mathematical proportions, or we can get a little bit away from it. Here, these columns are actually made of brick. And that is not unusual. They just were always parged with some kind of uh, material. Uh, but here they were left to make out of the brick. Again, very interesting building. New Lancaster High School that's just about to go under construction, uh, very much wanted that UVA look, Thomas Jefferson. And then you can start to peel away the classical architecture or flatten the classical architecture and still keep the proportions of columns or the proportions of space, but instead of space between columns, you have glass between columns, it starts to become a contemporary mix of the public monument. And that's cool too. And here's a, a, what I think is a very um, Ivy League campus building with a, just a hint of public monument uh, to make the center of the building because it's a 4-8 four, four, building and a 9-12 building on either side of this. Uh, it becomes a very nice balance of the building and the public monument piece of it uh, sort of accentuates the entrances. And then neoclassical architecture in the Depression era uh, was all flattened out and became a very popular style called Art Deco, but you can still see the origins of the classical proportions in the base, middle, top, all the things that you would see in a classical building are now in a new style that's traditionally or completely American, did not occur anywhere else, uh, and again it was the depression and the ability to take classical proportions and put them into buildings in a more flat, affordable way that that happened. And so you'll see a lot of buildings that don't look classical or public monument-like, but they are very Art Deco-like, and that is really uh, a, an alternate uh, outcome of using classical architecture in a more efficient way uh, from our own history and nowhere else. And there's a pretty classical public monument. Again, the columns aren't disengaged. They are not as overt as um, you know, the Ohio State Capitol, but they are engaged and they are flattened and they are very much the right proportions and style. So where are most schools today? This is what I call the wide middle, although it's kind of on the right of my scale. It, because we have the ability to do things with glass and curtain wall and transparency and lighting, uh, we tend to do that. So if you open an architectural school magazine today, you will see the middle two thirds are this kind of building. But there's no doubt that we are still using traditional materials. Red brick schools are still it. Uh, water tables of stone and limestone colored things are it but seeing more glass and seeing more transparency and seeing more ability to do things that look contemporary because the detailing allows for it. We have steel now that can make that span uh, and we can put glass under it. Um, here's an example. Uh, the brick, is, it's all brick, but it's not all red brick. So the decision to use red brick on the base and then use a lighter brick as a counterpoint that looks like maybe the limestone color, but it's actually brick, makes this building somewhat more contemporary. Um, and so you can make a building more contemporary, less contemporary, about some of the choices of materials that you make uh, and not get away from, again, the fact that they still are stone, red brick, 
sloped roofs, all the things that you would see in a traditional or Ivy League building. A very contemporary entrance on what is a the rest of the building is very uh, classical and simple. And again, tons and tons of red brick, uh, actually one million red bricks in each of these high schools. Um, not something you would see in a traditional building. Giant curtain wall in the cafeteria, giant curtain wall in the gym, and they're side by side. Um, so there's something that tells you that this building is not traditional, but also other things were very carefully balanced. Uh, the size of the windows, the height of the water table, the slope of the roof, all those things uh, are, are tr fairly traditional. So you get that mix, and you get this move to slider either way you want to go, more contemporary, more traditional. Here, the material palette is definitely traditional. The style and the architecture is definitely more contemporary. Um, and where the most contemporary details are used usually accentuates something different or important. In this case, uh, the entries to all these elementary schools in um, Southwestern City School District are, uh, are built this way. Here again, some obvious contemporary flares thrown in, some strange details thrown in, but then some very traditional um, materials and proportions thrown in. Very much what you would, again, when you open a magazine, this is kind of where the starting point is. Um, but we do not have to follow that. We can be more traditional or more contemporary if we want. Um, I think that's a great view down a street. Uh, again, the termination point of that street access is that entry, which is more contemporary, and everything around it is very, very traditional. And there's an example of, a, again, another big um, pediment, classical entry, but it's way about the glass and the corner glass and the contemporary detail of it, even though there's tons of red brick uh, thrown in there, uh, part, of the, part of the design. So that's a big one, and that one has the most breadth and the most ability to be one way or the other, depending on our potential. This is where we get to a point where we try not to be historic. We want our building to look of its age. We want it to look of its year it was built. We want it to be made of very staid materials, so still see lots of brick and lots of strong materials, but we want it to look like it wasn't something historically based. We want it to be ahistorical. So I would say contemporary is the best word to use for ahistorical. So you'll see non-traditional materials used just for the very express purpose of making it be more contemporary. This iron spot brick is definitely not traditional red brick schoolhouse. It's not. Even though it's still the same kind of brick made the same way, uh, it's different. Uh, this is precast concrete and curtain wall, intended to be non-historic, intended to be different from a red brick school. Lots of glass, still some red brick, uh, but again, career centers want to be a little different than traditional schools, traditional high schools, so they end up usually going toward this more contemporary look. Um, Woodward High School in Cincinnati. The building it replaced was one of the most classical buildings in all of Cincinnati, and now it's one of the most contemporary buildings in all of Cincinnati. Uh, because of curtain wall, because of steel exposed, because of the light they wanted, they wanted to be welcoming. This is at the corner uh, of a very important intersection in Cincinnati. Layering of the building. Uh, those layers of material aren't necessary, but they make the building look different. They make the building look more contemporary. Again, lots of red brick and limestone in this building, but nothing about it says traditional red brick schoolhouse. Curved, um, sloped, glass. This is um, Mandalia Butler High School. Um, the library roof was intended to be a wing for the Wright brothers. Sorry about that. There's the library. And there's a Wright flyer inside hanging up there. Uh, and again, everyone in Vandalia said we want a contemporary school and we want to celebrate the history of, of Dayton as the home of the Wright brothers. Nothing traditional there. Incredibly uh, impressive cantilevers. Castile can do that. Uh, no way this building could have been built more than 40 years ago because of the way um, it's constructed. Um, very traditional materials, but nothing about this building says traditional. There's too much glass, too many different ways that the materials are used. Uh, they're not used in a way uh, that says there's anything historic here. And then probably the most traditional. When you get away from all the traditional materials and you use glass as your primary uh, wall system, uh, it becomes super, super contemporary. Not squared corners, not anything uh, that you would find in a traditional uh, building. And again, we can take buildings this way, or we can take them all the way back to where we started. 
So we're going to ask these questions, and you're going to see the whole room's answers. And with a room here of about 90 people, uh, we're going to have a really, really good sample. In fact, I think we're going to have a sample that's very, very reflective of the community, uh, despite who decided they wanted to come tonight. Uh, and so has everyone got a response card? Somebody? Yeah. Somebody need one? Okay. Oh, question. Okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, no, no. I've heard about it, but I have not been there to see it. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Correct. Well, we had a student, Thomas, bring up the idea of keeping right. the, the old Thomas Gable, but putting it inside the building because it's small. Right. It probably wouldn't scale to the new building, but put it somewhere inside the building. I think it's a f fantastic yeah, idea. Yeah. yeah. Don't know what it involves. Don't know how it comes apart and how it goes back together. You saw what we did at Bond Hill, uh, where we kept the original outside entrance and put it back as the outside entrance. So all that is possible, and I know that it's already uh, been mentioned as a good idea. Okay. I definitely want to see that. So here's our styles again. I'll just review quickly. Traditional red brick schoolhouse, Ivy League campus, clearly one of our own uh, best examples in this community. Um, public monument, the traditional contemporary mix, which means it can slide either way, and the very contemporary. So let's exit this. So this process is, is very integrated. It works very well. Uh, basically, um, you get to push that clicker card as many times as you want. It still only registers one vote. Whatever you push last is what's going to show up. I've had people ask me, and they said kids going like this. <laughs> uh, quit. Sorry. Okay, so polling is open because the, t the triangle turned to a square. So if you take your clicker and you start clicking, you'll see when I get out of the way, uh, two people have responded. So I hope it gets up there in the 80s, 90s. You don't have to vote if you don't want, and we want you to be dis discerning. We don't want everything to be ones or sevens. If, if you're sort of interested in this, it doesn't mean that it's appropriate for the site. That's the most important question. So this is the first question for you is just how is your gut about this traditional red brick schoolhouse? It may not be the right thing for Thomas, but you're going to get to answer that question. So you, this is the one that's just the personal idea of it. So um, everybody push anything one through seven. If you push eight, nine, or zero on your card, it won't register. Uh, so anything between one and seven will work. There right. we go. And I'll, believe me, we get very fast at this at the end. It gets easier. So when I close polling, now your card will not work. There's our spread, and it's great. I love to see a spread. And we don't have one category that's not covered. And that's what's great about our, our sample here. It's a very large sample. So it's not strong in favor. It's not strong against. It's, it's a kind of a very level balance. Um, and that's, that's good. That's what we are today. It doesn't matter where I've done this before or how I've done this before. If you change your hat now, and we talk about Red Brick Schoolhouse fitting your community, that's a different answer, maybe. Maybe it's not a different answer for you. Uh, but now you get to click on your card, and look how fast you're getting in now. So I knew you'd learn quickly. OK. 
Okay, very different. Um, it does fit your community. Red Brick Schoolhouse does work here in Worthington. Um, not, there's a few of you who don't think so, and that's great. That's why this is differentiated. And there's very nice curve of you thinking that it fits very well. All right, the third question on Red Brick Schoolhouse, is it appropriate for the Thomas Worthington High School site as we know it? Anybody having trouble with their card, let me know. You'll actually see your answer in your window. It'll say a, a one, two, three, four, A, B, C, D uh, in your window uh, of your card. All right, again, more of a spread here. So while you think it fits the community, you don't have the same opinion that it's perfect for that site. So that's, that's why we answer or ask all questions. All right, now we're moving to Ivy League campus. This is your personal gut reaction. Nothing more. Don't care what anybody else says. This is you, you own this answer. It's all about what, you, what your gut tells you. And you seem to know because they're going in fast. All right, that is a very strong answer. I mean, it, it's, again, somebody, well, I guess no, nobody took a two, but somebody took everything else, and that's great that you did. I love that. But there is fit, but more than half of you think it's extremely appealing. All right, put your community hat on. Does it fit the community? Traditional Ivy League campus. And, and certainly the example we hold up is Kilbourne Middle School. Yep, it sure does. Okay, now the, the final, most important question on this style. Does traditional Ivy League campus appropriate for the Thomas Worthington High School site? Pretty much, very strong. Again, I love that there's somebody covering every base. Um, there's two of you who don't think it's appropriate at all, and that's awesome. There's one of you that thinks not so much, but there's 63% of you that think it very much is. And again, we're not picking one style tonight. We're picking from the results of all of this statistically. So we're looking for the spread. There might be a contemporary flair pushed into traditional League Ivy campus that somehow is even more popular. So public monument. The neoclassical architecture, Thomas Jefferson, Miami University architecture. Well, I guess Miami University isn't that, but Thomas Jefferson definitely is. This is your personal gut reaction. Interesting. <laughs> you get, look at that. It's strong. And so there's nothing particularly unappealing about classical architecture, but for you guys, a fourth of you, it's not happening. <laughs> Is it appropriate for this community? Okay, still a strong contingent of no way and everything in between. And I like the neutral. That's kind of where well, I think I would be here. All right, is it appropriate for the Thomas Worthington site? I did this for Gallup Police High School for all the students, 9 to 12, for 500 of them, and it was like a basketball game. They cheered and booed and yelled and <laughs> screamed. Okay, was, uh, not so much. That's good, and everything in between. All right, this is going to be the, 
the kind of proof in the pudding. Most rural school districts or school districts in the suburbs who have no context in their communities, this is kind of where they go because it's the middle, wide middle. They want, they want red brick, but they want contemporary. Um, this may be different for us, but this is the wide middle. Um, I suspect we'll get a wide answer here. Yeah, so some strong, and that's good to see. So there's some influence here and some negative. That's also influence, influencing here. How about contemporary material, or traditional materials, contemporary details fitting in your community? so much. And I, I agree. There is a very traditional aesthetic here um, that probably informs me this way. Even though some of you are up here, that's fine. Um, I, I see why that is. And now fitting on the site. Do we want more of a contemporary detail-oriented building for the Thomas Worthington site? Not so much. Okay. All right. This one may go hard left. I don't know. Contemporary, non-traditional, very intentionally contemporary. How do you feel personally about a very contemporary building? Yes. Is it, um, is it like cost That's an awesome question. That's an awesome question. Um, th there are some cost implications, and I would say contemporary is the most impactful because you use lots of glass, lots of uh, very heavy steel to cut cantilever, very strange things. That becomes more expensive. Um, and a red brick schoolhouse is about as easy to build as it gets. Um, so there's probably a range. It's not huge, but there are implications from traditional to contemporary. And that's a great question. And schools in the 40s, 50s, but, you know, post, post World War II, they made them very thin and very simple, um, and we didn't keep them because they didn't last. But we had to make buildings much cheaper than that sort of continuum we're talking about tonight, and, and it was an unfortunate thing. And so buildings that were built in the 20s, you know, like McConnell, they're still here. Buildings that were built in the 50s, they're, they're going away because they weren't built too well. Now, Thomas was built, I think, better than most in 1951, uh, and it's still here, but it's about to not be. Yeah. No, no, it's not that. It's 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 ten percent low to high. Yeah, it's you know three hundred and thirty dollars a square foot to three hundred and fifty dollars a square foot. It's not. Yeah, it is not huge. That's a very good point. Thank you for. I meant to make that. Okay. Uh, both there are some very contemporary fo thought, thoughtful folks here. All right. Does it fit the community? Yeah. Um, it's between Red Brick Schoolhouse and Ivy League campus. I mean, it's, it's got, you know, and, and it sort of has some newer uh, articulation now because of the little additions and things that were put on it. So it's kind of a mix. It's, but it's a very traditional building with some contemporary, you know, touches to, added to it. And I find that just fine, you know. All right, no, and I, I agree. I like contemporary architecture, but I don't know that it it's f fits the community. What about the site? More so or less so than the community? Not so much. Okay. So, um, I think uh, Ivy League campus is, is our origin story here in Worthington. I think definitely it's a piece of what we're going to do. I do think we're going to come back to you in the fall 
and we're going to be back here with, with, the, with this device again and these clickers again, and we're going to be showing some variations of that and how, how many contemporary things can we, can we put into a, um, a, a Kilbourn Middle School to make it a little better, a little different? We'll see. Maybe none, maybe more. Maybe there's bigger glass, maybe there's more glass. You know, there's some things that might be different. Um, it's certainly, we're not going to build Upper Arlington, and we certainly aren't going to build uh, even Worthington Kilbourne, which is traditional materials, contemporary details, definitely. So, but we'll be back here with a range still. We, we didn't just slam the door on one thing, but we do know that, that Kilbourne Middle School is, means something here. It, it, it garnered the most kind of um, impressions from all of you, both personally and as well as the site. Yeah. It's too small to, to fit, but it, it does have some historic history here. But it, so I think it'll have some place in the new building, but probably not on the front. Is it possible to have a kind of reinvision uh, of the building that would be in the side? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and definitely a gable, definitely a tower, definitely, you know, some you know, four columns kind of impression of, of a building, yes, different scale. But yeah, I think you're right. I'm just curious, yeah. did, did, the, did the kids go through the same exercise? And are you willing to share the results? They, they did not do this yet. They helped us with the programming and the choices of, of what spaces needed to change. They helped us with the idea of the porch over the ravine at, at Kilbourn. Uh, those came from kids, but and no lockers in the future high schools or very few lockers, that came from kids. Uh, those are things we're exploring. But we'll do this with the kids, especially the Thomas kids, and we'll, we'll see what they say. Yeah, there's one question, then I'll come over. That, that, that's a very good point. I mean, daylight and fresh air are massively important to education of all kinds. But yeah, you, you wouldn't put a curtain wall in a wood shop where you would be throwing, you know, two by fours from the saw through them. You know, I agree. So yeah, we have to think about those things. And I, I did point out that I think Kilbourne used more glass than the style dictated at the time, but it did so in a very effective way. The rooms at, in Kilbourne have tremendous daylight. And so I, th I think we'll be using more glass than average, but we have to be very thoughtful about it. Let me get over here first and then I'll come back. Okay. I didn't know that.
Yeah, yeah, okay, I hear you. Uh huh. The old high school. Mm-hmm. Right. Let me find that picture because the student said exactly that. Um, so, so right where you get in those two red areas, which are administration and guidance, there would be an indoor arch and an indoor gable. Right. Exactly. Before you get to that rotunda. And so it would be just like walking into the school today where you got to what used to be a wider entrance point behind that. So yeah, I, I love that. Yes, sir. Uh-huh. I agree with you. Even a lot of the other things you showed in that category are right. And I, I'm trying to show a range of not so well done and well done, and this is one of the most well done I've ever seen. Right. No, I, I don't disagree. It was well, well done. And yeah, I think disengaging a little more, uh, you know, overtly with the, with the entrance works. And, and it makes it make, 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 make it be, make it better. Yeah, it does. Yeah, but they didn't put square windows in. They put side by side tall windows in, which works great. Back to yellow. It could. So does, 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 is there are two new art rooms and one art room becomes a, a STEM lab or a photography lab or something like that. Those are the things we're going to do when we dive into the building with the departments. So hold that thought because that's an important one. Only basement space we would create would be for services, you know, piping, electric, duct work. There's no purpose being occupying a basement for a purpose of education. It's not better ventilation, it's not enough daylight, it's not good. But if we ran a supply tunnel underneath uh, the building because that's where the electric and piping ran, we would do something like that. Yes, sir, in the back. No. No, I don't know what the district wants to do, but we have a paper version of this that we can put online on the school website and people can weigh in on that. And yeah. I, I probably should have got this earlier, folks, because I know some people can't hear everything. I think Mike is hearing it, so wave at me if you got a question and I'll come with the mic. Is there an architectural style or uh, choice of materials that have been demonstrated to improve learning or to improve the health and safety of the children? So, so you know, not brick or stone, but, but daylighting is, there's a, a study called the Michonne study. It was done in five different parts of the country and they showed a massive difference in teaching and learning quality and success with more daylight and better air quality. So yes, wellness and daylight are huge factors in school design that need to be, um, need to be mindful of. Um, two things I wanted to, to touch on. One is um, just, I, I'm sure there's probably people that have questions and, and are seeing dollar signs. And um, I just feel it's worth reiterating that this is not just for aesthetics, but um, when you said this school has a three-quarter mile hallway, you weren't exaggerating. No. And uh, and I came for parent night. It's an unwieldy place to get around. It's hard for the kids to get from one one place to another. And to see that compact footprint is, I was really blown away because that's just so much better and so much more what it needs and, to be. And we heard that in spades from teachers and students here. Mm -hmm. 
It's and too far. I also wanted to ask about the parking lot. Okay. Um, because I was, I just happened to be at um, a Arlington High School the other day for my nephew's lacrosse game, and parking was a nightmare. And I had to circle the block, and it, it was a far walk, and. I, it made me realize how ideally centrally located this parking lot is, and I'm just wondering, I'm hoping that will stay where it is, or, or just where yeah. is that? Uh, to defend them, Upper Arlington's building a parking garage. Not that I think that's a great idea for students a and garage. parents using the school, wow. but they are building that, because now it's a mess. Kids are parking six blocks away from the high school. Um, you have a phenomenal site. You know, they have a five acre site, you have a 17 acre site. So you, you just have it in spades over them. And you have that number 10 parking lot, which we, we can even expand once we realign some of the fields. And so you have the opportunity to do that. And then we were putting a little bit of, of parking and maybe buses on the east side in the old footprint of the school that's going away so that we can separate parents and buses and do some things a little better. And again, we are very early in the site work phase. We just started getting our surveys and stuff done. So we have a lot more to do. We know that the, um, the street alignments at these two intersections are very important and they work and we're going to make them work better. We're not going to be putting new driveways out to um, Evening Street or putting driveways out so close to Evening Street that they're not safe. So we are building off of the success of these two things, but we're thinking about getting around the entire school for fire protection, for life safety, for um, you know, in school intruders, all those things, we want to make it safer. Question? question. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Speak loud. So, uh, in some of the uh, things that we looked at tonight, is, is there some of those designs or some of those capabilities that make it easier for sustainability and use of, like, uh, solar windows, things like that, that mm -hmm. help provide some of the power provide some Gr Great question. Uh, we're going to be LEED certified because we're staying sort of in relationship with the School Facilities Commission. That means that windows should face north or south because south sun is high, north sun isn't direct. East and west doubles your air conditioning load, doubles your heat gain in classrooms. All those things we're going to be thoughtful of. Materials that don't off-gas your, your aldehyde and other you know, chemicals, we're going to be thinking about all those things. So yes, we're going to be a lead gold, lead silver building minimum. Uh, so we're thinking about every one of those pieces and parts. And then the, the second piece about relocating the entry piece, I think that's a, that's a really fun idea. Uh, one of the ideas that popped into my head was you know, use it as the entry to the theater and build more key around it mm -hmm. and just kind of incorporate it such that it's usually it shouldn't even have space in the building of the theater, mm -hmm. but it's probably going to be a good story. Call. Right, another good idea. You were, yeah, that yeah. gentleman actually okay. asked my All question, right. but yeah, I just think with an opportunity with a building like this, a new building, we should really be focused on carbon footprint and yes. you know, just for Agreed. the future. So thank yeah. you. Minimum, absolutely. You, you want to go ahead? Oh, he's going up there. My question was more about Kilbourne. Um, you had the, the two arrows across for both Thomas mm -hmm. and Kilbourne. When you had the arrows on Kilbourne, was there any feedback that the square is too too much and that there should be a cross uh, corridor across the middle? I know that it goes over the ravine, the open space. Yeah. Was there any discussion about building uh, like a one or two story corridor across the middle of that? Or oh, anything? through through the open courtyard. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I talk to the principals and the students. They don't, they don't have a lot of traffic here. Most people come through this center core. Um, but this is intended on the first floor to connect uh, outside so you can connect. And I said, you know, this is art and STEM and labs and this is, uh, you know, classrooms. Most of the academic classrooms are upstairs where the corridor are already is enclosed and does connect. I hadn't heard anybody talk about crossing the middle. We, they did, we are moving the offices away from here, down here, so that the media center, the breakout rooms for kids, the louder space for kids, the outdoor space for kids is in this um, access. So this was intentional here that this be the center of the school and be where most student activity occurs. And this loop, uh, it's, a, it's a question. I asked them if they wanted me to enclose this in glass and they said there's not that much traffic that uses that loop. Now that could change as we dive deeper into it. Up there, Jeff. Is, oh. <laughs> is this building intended to last like another 50 years yes. after it's built or? 
Yes, okay. lifespan should be a minimum of 50 years. And again, if they're made more sustainable and they're made, to, th that should change that formula. Um, but I'm an architect of 40 years now, and I'm starting to see people question the buildings I built in the first years of my career, whether they should be replaced or they should stay and be renovated because they're not sustainable, because they're made of different materials and those kinds of things. So, so would you, like uh, from what I've heard, because my brother's a civil engineer, um, materials like plastic or like those cheaper materials that are more susceptible to like weather because we get a lot of tornadoes here in, right. in Ohio. Do you think we'd refrain from using those right. as much? No, heavy, heavy stayed materials, yeah. Plastic is also petroleum based and also has gassing and those kind of issues. So yeah, we're gonna be thinking, you know, about staying with very traditional earth-like materials. <laughs> Behind you, Jeff. Oh, there's. So within, within the fifth section of the previous photo, you had a section that primarily includes our science classrooms and the STEM wing. Um, within the relevance of Intel moving into Ohio and the ah. industry importance of the Project Lead the Way program, which is exemplary and used by Worthington schools. Mm -hmm. It's not only imperative that students get those certifications, but also that they have the facilities necessary to do so. Is there an intention to preserve, if not expand, the current Project Lead the Way classrooms to so, provide more opportunities right. here? So what happens in classrooms and what happens in this building is above my pay grade. But there's people in this room that are hearing you, and I agree with you completely. Intel is a game changer and there's gonna be different, different programs and different educational focuses that are coming that we should be thinking about because this is a 50 year building. So great, great point. Yes. I have a question about, it's a very specific question, about the wrestling room. Because you say that you're not gonna do much to the existing uh, gym and the practice gym. Which, which but school? the wrestling room needs which, some help. Yeah, which school are you talking? Thomas. Okay, uh, yeah, we heard you. Molly actually came up with an awesome idea Again, I won't take credit. Uh, there we go. So the upper deck of the competition gym has wall fold forward bleachers. So you, there's a lower le level and then there's an upper level. We're gonna change those bleachers to forward fold so they create a wall and they wall off the gym. Behind that is a brand new wrestling room for three mats because the current wrestling room is going to become uh, another locker room, so because it's too tiny. So yes, we heard that. So there's a new varsity basketball locker room there. There's a way to connect to the gym from the top so that all the traffic isn't coming in here. So yes, why I said we were renovating, we aren't leaving everything exactly as it is, and, and Molly already knew what you were thinking and has addressed it. Yep. Folks, I, w I want to throw out, Mike has no life, so he'll stay here and answer questions all night. I sure will. Um, but I, I want to remind everybody, these are very preliminary. He calls it jello, I call them bubble diagrams. But when we answer a specific question about wrestling room, this is an idea. And we've heard it, whether that is where it winds up in the end, we don't know yet. But we've heard those kinds of issues. So I, I just want to caution folks that don't leave tonight and say, oh, they're building yep. a wrestling yep. room up above the, that. That may yeah. be, it's an idea, it may not. Just depends on where it all goes. Uh, today I drove past the baseball field area and noticed that there are two um, porta johns there. And it made me think whether we're going to have any uh, restroom facilities for some of the outdoor, like the you know the baseball field, the softball field. You know what it, what are their capabilities for that? I didn't think porta johns were great. Nope, you're right. And so to Je with Jeff's admonition from the last question. Uh, the idea would be there would be a new press box, outdoor restrooms, and a building that serves both softball and baseball if we get, if we get there that way. Um, so that, that's something that other people have thought of too. I was going to answer it by saying we're putting in a third port of john but. <laughs> Hi, I just was wondering, um, I'm kind of new into this. I just got braces, so I'm the oldest patient ever to have braces. But, um, are, is the exterior of the buildings being retained or extended? You've probably discussed it, but I don't know. Are, well, you, keeping the, are you keeping the exteriors? The, 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 the face that you see from the parking lot, the, the, you'll see a lot of the same materials, the same exterior. The, the sp stuff you see in orange, that's all new. What we're gonna still try to match this, the look and feel of a Thomas, and we're still gonna go the direction that this group tells us to go, 
uh, but it, it's going to be a lot of new exterior skin. Thomas will be mostly new and, and Kilborn will be mostly the same. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Here at Thomas is the proposed uh, theater or auditorium and stage similar in size to this one. You want to take that one, Jeff? <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the things that is under discussion. Um, I will say to you, as Mike showed, part of the premise was do we rebuild do we reuse this existing building and, and gut the inside and redo the inside, or do we change it? Um, in the layout that we've looked at at this point, it makes some sense to turn the auditorium. Whether this is about 1,200 seats, whether it will be 1,200 seats or whether it will be similar in size uh, to Kilbourne, which is around 900, isn't decided yet. Some of the question is how frequently do we fill it? How often do we, do we need it? You know, there's obviously a cost of doing that larger size. So there's, there's a lot of discussion about that. It's not final at this point. I'm, I'm heading over there for the next question. <clears throat> okay. No, not at all. It's very, very early. It's jello. It's jello now. We think that footprint um, is the right amount of stuff inside. Is it the right place? Do we slide it left to right, up, down? I don't know. Uh, we do know that we want to preserve the front yard as it is, so we don't see it coming closer to the street than the current high school. Um, so those are some limits that we think are pretty staid, but it is just jello. So. Um, that came up with the city this week. So there's sidewalk here, here, and it stops right there. So we're talking about what, what it would take to complete that to the corner. Right, that's that yellow orange box right there in the middle. The green square is just grass area that this kid said was important to them and don't build over it. So I just showed it. It's an outdoor, outdoor green space that they like to use. They it exists a, right now. Yeah, and they built a shelter house on the back of it, and they go out there for outside time. So that's the elementary. I thought that was the outdoor classroom. It probably is that, too. You know, it probably gets shared that way. That, that's what we're, we've got to make sure we do. Um, you know, Evening Street's not part of this project at all, but if Evening Street has to get replaced in a footprint, it probably makes the tennis courts move, uh, and we've looked at some places for that. We have a beautiful site to the west, but it's mostly floodplain, so we have very few limita or very great limitations what we can do there. Um, but those are all great things to be concerned about. We don't have any concerns about Evening Street right now, but in some day, if in phase three, there's new elementary schools and Evening Street's one of them, what do we do? And, and we don't want to make a decision about where the new auditorium is that takes Evening Street out of, out of the site, out of the picture. So it's, it's a great Have you decided um, and said how much it's going to cost? Have you set a, set a goal for the um, cost? Yes, our construction manager has looked at costs and he's looked at size and program and he's looked at inflation because We've had a massive inflation in the last couple of years, and so all that's being planned by our construction manager. You got the microphone, Jeff. <laughs> I'm going to let the boss answer this one. Okay. <laughs> so. Guys, I'm Trent Bowers. I get to work as the superintendent here. We, we believe that phase two of the master facility plan will, will likely cost around $234 million. And that, that's with projected increases in continual cost increases over the next five years in this building process. And so 
Um, we all know that construction costs are up 40 percent since 2018, and the, we're talking about significant square footage. Um, so these are these are projects that will hopefully serve Worthington um, for the next 40 to 50 years. Um, and for Worthington School standpoint, once we've done the high schools, we will have renovated or replaced all of our sixth through twelfth grade um, schools with our with phase one being the middle school projects. And again, have really set up this community for a really good spot that all kids benefit from. But it is these are really expensive projects because construction at this number this amount of square footage is really expensive right now. So. Well, I mean, that's a, that's a different conversation. Um, when you, uh, Ohio translates, so school districts pay for capital projects um, by selling bonds, or they ask a community for bond issues. And so Ohio translates that amount of money into what they call mills. And so to build phase two of the master facility plan, the school district would have to ask taxpayers to approve a bond issue of around 4.6 mills. Now the exciting thing is when the school district comes forward probably in the fall for that bond issue um, there are 3.6 mills of current millage or taxation that we're all paying that are going to be paid off in the fall. So those will go away. So what we'll have to be asking for is 4.6 new mills but you're already paying 3.6 of those mills, so it's really one additional mill of taxation to be able to fund all of these projects. So it's a real opportunity that we have as a community to have this new coming on when this old is gonna be able to go away. So while this is going to be really expensive, um, it's also an opportunity that will, it'll never be more affordable than the opportunity that we're going to have in front of us as a community. And, and when you're in Thomas Worthington High School, you see this building needs replaced. It's not adequate for 2022. Um, and it's also a, a community issue in that we want to remain competitive as a, as a community. And you see Upper Arlington with a new high school and Grandview Heights is opening their new high school in the fall. And, Westerville South replaced their high school, and Gehanna is in the process of replacing their high school, and all of the Olentangy schools are newer than ours, and all of the Dublin schools. It's time for Worthington to make sure that we remain competitive in a place where, where families want to continue to come. And um, So that's all to come. Our, our conversation tonight, obviously, financials are always part of the conversation. Um, and, and frankly, even at that budget, we won't get everything we want. I mean, we're, we're, like, that's just the reality of any construction project. If you've, if you've redone the kitchen in your house recently, and a lot of you have, because I see the dumpsters outside, um, you know that you start with an idea, and you think it's an amazing idea, and then you see the cost, and you scale back a little of that idea to meet the budget, and it still costs more than you think it was going to cost. And I, that's, that's the issue with school, with school um, funding as well. Well, I mean, if you, if you put it off, you put it off, and it just puts, you know, continues to put the community behind. Um, because we also have elementary schools that are aging, and they're going to have to be replaced over time as well. So Worthington has six elementary schools that were built in the 50s and 60s. Um, and so we know that those also are going to need. All right, there's no question. And my hope is that goes down by fall, but it may or may not. So my guess is it won't be put off. Now the community will have to make a decision on, on whether they support it. Yeah. Yep. So one thing about this discussion just now is the competition between, you know, all these building schools and a lot of these buildings. And one thing that I'd like to emphasize in this conversation as a community for the uh, Thomas and Anthony Street Building School is that the Thomas Worthington School District is a really good school district. And so we Yeah, so let me point out first that this is uh, two of our really incredible um, Worthington students 
who will benefit from these projects. Um, and as, as they advocate for their educational spaces, that's pretty cool as the school superintendent. So one of the neat things here is you see us, we, you, know, you see athletics, you understand what that is, but what you really see on here is a significant expansion of our arts programs. Um, so almost double the current square footage that we have for, for our arts programs. Um, in both of these high schools, and that's really important to us. And then, obviously, everything gets touched. So if Worthington Kilborn High School, there's a total renovation of every square foot in the building, which means all of those updated science labs, all of those updated project lead the way spaces. And those become new spaces at Thomas Worthington because, obviously, everything that you see there is going to be new space. So a real understanding of our students need modern learning spaces to meet, to meet to, today's needs, tomorrow's needs, and it needs to serve us for the next 40 to 50 years. And then Mike talks a lot about things like daylighting and fresh air and indoor outdoor spaces, the kind of things that again, um, we all expect um, for our kids and that our kids deserve, so. What's the desired timeline? So our desired timeline um, would be that more than likely our, our, our Board of Education continues to discuss a ballot issue, but more than likely we'll see a ballot issue in November of 22. Um, we have um, are already in the design phase, so we would like to be able to break ground if, if the community supports the issue um, in April of next, of, of 23. Um, and then, um, Mike, am I correct that it'd be a 2025, 2026 right. finish? Finish in 26. Finish in 26. Mm -hmm. um, and and, and, and let, let's be honest, with a lot of challenge in the middle, right? Because we are going to um, operate school on this site and on Worthington Kilbourne site while we rebuild these schools. Um, and so, you know, obviously that's going to challenge us. Yes, sir. Yes. And I noticed uh, just from the information that the offices were going to be moved, and the reason that they're there was that students on their lunches, and everybody saw the, the big commons area, well, that's where the, and so the idea that the offices were across from the commons was so that students didn't have to go through hall monitors to go to the offices, so they could see uh, assistant principals, they could see yeah, it's, it, it, you know, it came up. Eric, the principal, said that exact thing. Um, we talked about it not being very far different, you know, being just below where the current media center is, and that the media center being open for more of that, you know, a quiet space, coffee shop space, loud space, outdoor space, kind of being in one continuum. Um, and I think the school it has more of an open feel than it did when it was first built. So kids are allowed to leave the cafeteria without a monitor pass or those kind of things. And I think that's a little bit of a change. Um, but, but that exact conversation took place. And it, maybe it'll overwhelm us before we're done. And we'll be more in that direction again. It's a good question. So how is that being done in Thomas in the plan? Um, it, well, it's, it's, again, all new. So at Thomas, it... The red space is the administration, the cafeteria is brown, and then the media center is up above the red space. So there's a floor split that doesn't occur at, at Kilbourne, um, and it maybe is actually the better solution based on what I just heard, because the, the office and guidance areas are right adjacent to the student commons. But one of the things that we know, Worthington Kilbourne High School was designed incredibly well, right? And so it, and it, you've got that core where you've, got, where you've got the auditorium and then the student commons and then the athletics. That's kind of what you're trying to see here with Thomas Worthington, where, you know, Mike's going away from it, but that's what you're trying to yes. see at Thomas Worthington, where you've got that center core of a student common space, an auditorium that opens up into it, an athletic piece, obviously much more transitional for our students. Um, 
at Worthington Kilbourne, you're going glass to glass. Now we're going all over the place. But anyway, you can kind of see that we're trying to mirror the really positive things from Worthington Kilbourne's design into the new Thomas Worthington. Exactly. So if you're a visitor, yeah, there's, there's a receptionist here, there's a front door here. If you're a student, you're most likely parking over here, or if there's buses here or there's buses here, there's places to do. There is a primary east, west, north and south entrance, and I'm not telling the school 50 years from now how they should welcome guests and where they should do it, but there are four primary controlled entrances in the school, um, and that now there's probably 15 uh, uncontrolled entrances to the school. So Mike, talk about for us next steps and we'll wrap up tonight. So okay. what, what, will the, what can people expect from a next steps? We're gonna refine the jello a little into, you know, we have questions for the administrators about science on multiple floors versus one floor. We have some music spaces that we wanna tweak. We have some outdoor site work to be coming. That's all gonna happen over the summer. In the fall, we're gonna be back here showing you elevations and images, computer models of the school, and we're gonna be then getting with the teachers and the students and diving into every room, every art room, every music room, every science lab, every English room, and we're gonna say, where's the technology? Where's the windows? Where's the chalkboard or tack board or whiteboard or none, no board because it's all TV digital now? We're gonna be getting through all that with students and teachers. Fall of September? Fall of September, yes. Fall of September, thank you. Or late soon August. As soon as school's back in. Yeah. All, right, All right, guys. Th thank you for coming out. Mike will be here to ask, answer a few more questions.